joining us. Really excited to have you here for this uh, amazing uh, August 2023 session uh, of Brinix Community Life. Uh, and this particular one is theme around ethical applications of AI in healthcare. Uh, for the duration of uh, this presentation, please stay muted if not presenting, and we'll be recording this and putting it on our YouTube channel. So if you miss parts of it, you can always view it later. To give you a background about uh, BrainX community, it's a community that we formed a few years ago and with the idea uh, that we needed to have a platform for machine learning or AI in healthcare for good, and we have had five uh, plus very successful years and grown the community to 5,000 plus international members and 2,500 just on LinkedIn, uh, very active participation there. Uh, you can go to our website, check out all the resources, uh, latest updates. And then we have the connect segment where we uh, use uh, a lot of these sessions. Uh, information is posted over there and also connection to our YouTube channel. So if you miss anything, you can always uh, connect from here and watch it later. Uh, as I said, we have our YouTube channel. I would highly encourage you to subscribe it so that you can uh, watch these sessions in case you missed it. Uh, it will be delivered to your, your email. Uh, as I previously mentioned, a very active LinkedIn group, a lot of scholarly activities and opportunities to connect are shared over here. So would highly recommend to share this information with your friends, join us there and uh, share scholarly activity. We have a learn section where we provide a list of curated articles. These are articles that are making a lot of waves about AI and healthcare. And you might want to learn about uh, different specialties and what's going on over there. Large language models uh, are, are a big deal these days. So you'll find a lot of those uh, on uh, in the learn section these days. Uh, we cannot provide you the articles themselves. We provide you with the links. They're categorized. So you can filter them for your healthcare specialty. Similarly, everybody is looking for data and we provide a lot of open source data set links. Uh, of course, we cannot provide you with the data itself, but these are again uh, curated based on different specialities and the data types. So you can just go there, search for your healthcare specialty data and uh, hopefully get a simple DUA done and have access to that. Podcast series features uh, prominent uh, experts from across the world, both from the machine learning side and from the from the healthcare side or others uh, who are interested in AI and healthcare applications. So listen to their, their work, uh, listen about their journey and listen about their vision for the future. So subscribe on your favorite YouTube channel, uh, favorite podcast uh, channel, and you can get that delivered to you. And we also uh, provide a lot of information about upcoming meetings and conferences now that COVID is gone. Uh, hopefully uh, we can connect and we can uh, uh, hopefully collaborate at these meetings or conferences. And with that, the, the theme for this particular session is something that is of critical importance. So we have seen a lot of research work around AI and healthcare, a lot of applications, now 500 plus FDA approved applications making it to clinical workspace. But I think there are some key uh, ethical challenges. A couple of publications recently uh, that highlighted that too, uh, if not more. And uh, we want to touch upon some of the issues relating uh, uh, ethics uh, in AI and ethics, especially when it comes to application in healthcare. And we have some very prominent speakers, uh, Leo Anthony Sully. Uh, thank you, Leo, for joining us. He's the principal research scientist at MIT, associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, his number of publications are enormous, but more than anything else, I appreciate him for championing uh, ethical application of AI in healthcare. Uh, he has done a lot of work over there and uh, has nudged us to think about it, think about how to approach and make sure that we try to eliminate biases related to AI and healthcare applications. So thank you, Leo, for joining us. We have uh, Dr. Shreya Mishra. Uh, she is PhD from IIIT Delhi and uh, works at Cleveland Clinic as postdoc. Uh, she will be talking about some of her recent research work related to uh, uh, ethical applications in AI uh, by itself. And then lastly, uh, it will be uh, 
Dr. Lama Nazir. She is clinical affairs manager and critical care clinical pharmacy specialist at King Hussein Cancer Center in Jordan. Uh, she has done uh, an enormous amount of work in data science with the recent publication related to how to mitigate bias uh, in AI or prediction models related to healthcare. And she'll be enlightening about us about uh, that work. So with that, I'm actually going to uh, invite doc Dr. Uh, Leo Anthony Sully to start off and kick us off and talk about you know his view about ethical apl application of AI in healthcare, some of the challenges we face, and and some of the the uh, vision that he has how to uh, how to deal with it. Leo. Sorry, I was talking. Uh, let me do that again. Uh, there you go. Can you see it now? Yes. Perfect. So thanks for the invitation. My name is Leo. Uh, I work in the intensive care unit at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center here in Boston. Research is based at MIT. And the title of this talk is Big Data, Big Bias. The Road to Hell is Paved with Good Intentions. And I think we're now becoming more aware that AI has one huge conundrum. If we evaluate AI based on their accuracy against real world data, we get AI that legitimizes and augments systemic inequities. To gauge the magnitude of biases in generative AI, uh, Bloomberg recently used stable diffusion to generate thousands of images related to job titles and crime. And what they did was they prompted the text to image model to create representations of workers for 14 jobs, 300 images each for seven jobs that are considered high paying and uh, 300 images each for seven jobs that are considered low paying. And to the left, we see the images generated for CEOs. And you can, you can definitely see that the vast majority of men of them are white males. And then to the right are generated images of fast food workers. And for the first time, we start seeing uh, representations of uh, individuals of color. The analysis found that images generated for every high paying job were dominated by subjects with lighter skin tones, while subjects with darker skin, skin tones were uh, commonly generated by prompts like fast food worker. Categorizing images by gender tells a similar story. Most occupations in a data set were dominated by men, except for low paying jobs like housekeeper and cashier. Meanwhile, in the healthcare domain, we asked GPT-4 differential diagnosis and treatment recommendations using case vignettes from the New England Journal of Medicine. For example, we use a description of a patient with shortness of breath or a college student with sore throat. We use identical text prompts, but each time we change the sex and race ethnicity of the patient. This is a busy slide, but I just would like to summarize what we found. For the case of shortness of breath, panic attack anxiety disorder ranks significantly higher on the differential diagnosis when the patient is a woman. For the case of sore throat in a college student, acute HIV and syphilis were ranked significantly higher for black students. On the right-hand side of the slide, we asked GPT-4 for treatment recommendations for patients presenting to the emergency department. In the same manner, we use identical text prompts apart from the sex and race ethnicity of the patient. And in almost all of the cases, a CT scan is less likely to be suggested if the patient were black. There are four mental models of the world. The first one is the world as it should be, and that's the world that we are aspiring to, uh, to, to have. The second is the world as it is, and then the world as captured by the data, and then the world reinforced by the models. The world as captured by the data is even farther away from the world as it should be because of the social patterning of the data generation process. And the world reinforced by the models is even farther away because of an AI community that is oblivious to the social patterning 
of the data generation process. To that mo mental models, I add a fifth model of the world, the world according to AI peddlers. In this world, social problems can be fixed by for-profit data-driven solutions. Concerns that belong to the public domain are reimagined as entrepreneurial opportunities in the marketplace. To be fair, Silicon Valley's many apps, such as those to monitor our spending, calorie intake, and workout regimes are occasionally helpful, but they mostly ignore the underlying causes of poverty or obesity. In this world, AI, as framed by its peddlers, is rooted in the culture of efficiency in a world where markets measure the worth of things. AI 1.0, AI as it exists now, fails to grasp the messy interplay of values, missions, and traditions at the heart of institutions, an interplay that is rarely visible if one is only scratching the data surface. And in this world, investments in technology will augment human intelligence more than investment on education and culture and the institutions that nurture them. And finally, in this world, those who sit at the table are all knowing and benevolent. And of course, this world is, does not exist, it's imaginary. So how do we move forward? We see only one path to forge for AI to benefit everyone, and it has two requirements. The first is regulatory guardrails, not voluntary self-regulation as suggested by the White House, but policies and incentive structures that result from continuous open dialogue and which engages communities that are disproportionately burdened by disease. The second requirement is an expansive dialogue about the methods and stakeholders involved, emphasizing the what, the, the how, and the who over the what, who are sitting at the table and charting the course of AI. Investments should be channeled towards building transparent, accountable, and inclusive pipelines for AI development and deployment. At present, billions of dollars are poured into data sets, computational resources, and environments. The machine learning community is preoccupied with what models to build and what benchmarks to evaluate against. But unless we prioritize the who, who are developing and deploying AI, and the how, is there transparency and accountability for responsible AI, the tens of billions of dollars of investment are all for naught. Finally, we've heard this saying before, a system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. The way we deliver care is informed by a knowledge system that is perfectly designed to produce health disparities. The way we are building AI models right now is perfectly designed to perpetuate stereotypes and structural inequities. What exactly are we referring to when we say system? A system is not just the data infrastructure or the organizational chart or a compendium of policies. A system is the unwritten set of rules that dictates how we think, how we learn, how we solve problems, and most importantly, how we work together. And with that, I'm gonna pass on to the true speakers for today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leo. That was very powerful. And uh, I think a lot for us to think about as we do all the research work and we design these systems, uh, th that is some great thought. And uh, please post your comments or, or questions. We'll take them uh, in a bit for all of our speakers. But in the meantime, I'll invite uh, Dr. Shreya Mishra uh, to talk about what we discovered when we were looking at uh, the ethical uh, concepts as they were applied to AI-based research. So this is not about just healthcare, but AI research in general, uh, some of our key findings. So, Shreya. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, today I, I'll be discussing uh, the highlights of our essay, Ethical AI is All We Need, uh, which we have written under the Kaggle Competition 2023 Kaggle AI Report. So, in this essay, we have utilized different approach to discover different dimensions of ethical principles in AI-based research publications. Okay, so as we all know, ethics in AI is very critical and essential component. I would like to present an example here. Uh, we are currently in an era of 
generative AI and conversational AI. But these models are highly useful in building chatbots who talk like humans. But a dark side of these chatbots are that they might be misleading and lead to severe outcomes. For example, a researcher in Belgium chose, chose to end his life after engaging in discussions after about the, fu uh, about the future of climate change with an AI chatbot ca called Eliza. These incidents are really saddening and needs attention. Uh, also, when we talk about controversies associated with AI applications, uh, sadly, the numbers are increasing every year. Uh, we have analyzed the AI AIC data, which is basically a database consisting information of AI-related controversies. And we found that from 2007 to 2021, numbers have increased from 8 to 178. Similarly, we looked at the geographical uh, distribution in figure B, and we can see the controversies are not concentrated in limited areas. These are spread all over the world. We suggest that AI is a global concern. Uh, so in this work, we took the AI ethical principles defined by European uh, Commission of Guidelines, uh, which basically factors human agency and oversight, uh, robustness and safety privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity and fairness, societal and environmental well-being and accountability. So, and we tried to uh, measure airwise trend of these ethical principles in archive research papers using computational approaches. And we performed four analyses on these papers, uh, which are uh, gender representation learning, uh, development mat maturity learning, sentiment learning and contextual topic learning. Uh, we took the uh, data set uh, arc of archive papers, uh, which is provided in Kaggle competition. Uh, then we selected the categories of these papers, which are specifically focusing on areas related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. We selected categories based on archive taxonomy, uh, which were CS.AI, uh, which was artificial intelligence, CS.CL, uh, computational and uh, language, CS.CV, uh, computer vision and pattern recognition, CS.LG, uh, which is machine learning, and, and STAT.ML, which is machine learning. So interestingly, all categories have papers more than 40K with maximum in category CS.LG. And from the overall trend, we can see that year-wise collection of all archive papers is increasing. And we started our analysis with a contextual topic learning. In this analysis, we have used bird-based uh, topic models. By definition, topic modeling is computational technique that uncovers hidden thematic structures uh, within a collection of documents and identifying underlying key topics. And this analysis is helpful to understand the key theme of research and important research topics. After analyzing the clustered scatter plot of all the articles and their associated topics, we have identified the following as the top eight key topics within the complete set of articles, which were uh, graph, causal knowledge, reinforcement learning policy, image learning neural, uh, adversarial uh, detection an anomaly, emotion COVID recognition, fairness influences, federated learning edge, and forecasting time series. Most importantly, we found from topic trends analysis that there was a focus on theory and architecture development while research lacked expansion into ethics, social good, human collaboration, underrepresented domains, and long-term safety. This ignorance of ethical concerns like diversity, fairness, and societal and environmental well-being merits further study into real-world outcomes of proposed AI models in our development maturity analysis. And here, uh, the figure represents the temporal variation of topics. After analyzing the dynamic trends of topics over time, we observed that the topic graph causal knowledge have the highest frequency throughout the years 2007 to 2023, except in 2019. Uh, the topic reinforcement learning policy planning consistently holds the second highest frequency from 2007 to 2018 and reaches its highest frequency in 2019 among all the articles. 
interestingly in the year uh, in the recent years uh, 2021 and 2022 uh, the topic image learning neural recognition surpasses the frequency of the topic reinforcement learning po policy planning becoming the second most frequent topic after graph causal knowledge so this ignorance of ethical concerns like uh, diversity fairness and societal and environmental well-being merits further study into the real world outcomes of proposed ai models in our development maturity analysis next analysis is development maturity learning of research papers we adopted uh, this definition approach uh, from the published paper in, in Lancet Digital Health. A research paper is defined as mature if it has a, a real-world robust application. Development maturity learning takes us further into the con ethical considerations surrounding transparency, societal and environmental well-being, robustness, safety and account accountability. So we used a bird-based approach uh, developed to classify research papers maturity based on their abstracts. And we used a uh, title and abstracts as uh, predictors to compute a paper's maturity level. And uh, we further used uh, generative additive models to assess trends and derive more insights. So mature articles across various categories from 2007 to 2022 uh, are shown here. Uh, we found an upward trajectory through with, uh, uh, through with uh, distinct rates of growth across each category. For example, within the domains of CS.AI and CS.CL, mature articles exhibit consistent growth from 2007 to 2022. Conversely, the CS.CV category experienced a noteworthy surge while CS.LG showed a sustained upward trend. A particularly intrig intriguing revelation emerged from the stat.ml category, where the count of mature articles initially surged until 2019, only to take a downward turn, hinting uh, at a significant shift in the prevailing trend. Uh, to further probe inclusive and ethical AI development, we next analyze gender representation in AI publications, an essential step towards AI for all. Here we uh, performed, uh, performed the gender representation learning where we have measured the gender biasness. We defined the gender biasness as a uh, difference in proportion of female and male authors in the publication. Overall female authors proportion is 0.34 uh, with 95% confidence interval between 0.3414 to uh, 0.3432, while the overall male author proportion is 0 0.65. And uh, then next we performed analysis uh, to learn temporal trend in gender biasness. Interestingly, we found a decreasing trend of gender biasness, which revealed uh, that gender diversity is increasing over the years. Also, we calculated the sense slope to understand the magnitude of decreasing trend uh, in different categories of ar archive publications. We found that CS.AI has most negative and CS.CV CS has less negative trend, which recommends that gender representation in overall AI categories is improving with highest rate. After gender representation learning, finally, we performed sentiment analysis to study sentiment trends, a strong signal of trustworthiness. Uh, and these signals are helpful to learn situations like AI winters. Uh, for, for this, we classified the sentiments of research papers into positive and negative categories and analyzed the trend. Interestingly, we found that proportions of positive sentiments is almost equal, uh, which we have further confirmed by chi-square test. Uh, these, find, uh, these findings suggest that AI research publications carry an overall balanced sentiment in the, examine, ex in the examined publications. However, it is important to remain vigilant and continuously monitor sentiment proportions to ensure sustainability of AI research and associated research allocations. And we hope our analysis is uh, one of the starting points for additional work in systematic methods to address the evaluation of ethical principles in AI research. Finally, I would like to conclude with Dr. Watkins' statement, 
uh, models in my view can inform policy and strategy that we as humans have to create. Computational models can inform and generate knowledge, but that does not equate with change. And with that, I would like to conclude uh, the presentation and congratulate our awesome team uh, that contributed uh, to this essay. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mishra. That, that, was, uh, that was awesome. And uh, th these papers included some of the healthcare papers. So it was, it was just all the computer science papers, but some of them were, were uh, including focus on, on healthcare too. So we're trying to see uh, the ethical application of AI in general. Is, is that where the issue is? And how do we prevent that from cre creeping in into healthcare? Uh, so, so thank you for, for your insights there. And with that, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Laman Nazir to uh, make her presentation about uh, what we need to do to prevent these biases from creeping into healthcare. Great, thanks. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, hello everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you, BrainX community, and thank you, Piyush, for the invitation and for, um, for the opportunity to present this work. So what I'm going to talk about today is specifically regarding um, a bias within AI algorithms uh, and re some recommendations in terms of how we can make it, mitigate such bias. Um, I'm going to touch very briefly on kind of the advantages and disadvantages of uh, <clears throat> AI-based tools. Um, but the, the main focus will be, again, on identifying the sources of bias within each uh, step of developing an AI algorithm. And as we go through those steps and those sources of bias, um, I'll highlight certain strategies or certain approaches in terms of how we can address those, um, those sources of bias and how we can try to mitigate uh, bias within the models that are developed. Um, so we all, we've all heard about the good side of AI. Um, and I think whether we're a clinician, whether we're a data scientist, whether we're, we're a lay person, we've heard this in the media, um, that AI tools can perform clinical tasks that are comparable or even at a greater precision compared to humans. Uh, they can actually work faster, they can perform faster than humans, and therefore would be able to provide care to more patients. And then they, they took it even a step further with AI that it can actually actually expand the reach of quality health care to underserved areas and therefore improve the health equity. So if there, you know, if a clinician is in a, in a rural setting and has no access to specialized uh, um, devices or specialized uh, um, uh, a specialized setting, uh, the AI tools could potentially or the AI algorithms could potentially um, help guide uh, the decision and provide a better uh, quality of care and therefore, again, enhancing health equity. Uh, now, it sounds like it's a very rosy picture, but then on the other side, and that's what we're seeing more and more coming out in the literature, is that these algorithms that are derived um, have biases within, within those derived algorithms. Um, and those biases could lead to health disparities, could lead to bias decisions, and could potentially result in harm. Um, and that's where, again, there were a lot of red flags flags that came up as more and more literature started uh, kind of demonstrating some of the bias associated with the AI algorithms. Uh, this is one of the, uh, I would say, one of the very popular studies that came out, and it, it really raised a lot of concern. This was uh, a few years ago by Obermeyer uh, and, and colleagues. And what they did is they actually looked at an AI algorithm that was widely utilized and implemented in health in the US healthcare system. And that algorithm was designed to identify patients who would qualify for high risk care management uh, programs. Um, when they looked further into that algorithm, it appeared that black patients who had the same risk score as white patients, they actually were sicker than the white patients. Um, and one of the main reasons for that was that the healthcare expenditure was what was used as a proxy for severity of illness. And now we all know that um, how much you spend on health care could be associated with the severity of illness, but that's not the only element because there could be patients that are severely ill, but they just don't have the access to health care and therefore their expenditure tends to be much lower. Um, and when they adjusted that algorithm, it was pretty alarming knowing that 
uh, the percentage of black patients that would be identified as um, eligible for the, for such high risk care management program would actually increase from 17% to close to 50%. So we're looking at a huge jump and that really, again, raised concerns in terms of health bias and health disparities within the algorithms that are derived. So this is kind of what uh, got us into uh, writing our paper that was published recently, looking at bias in, in AI algorithms and identifying recommendations for mitigation. And what we did is we actually took each step of developing uh, the algorithm and looked at what are the potential sources of bias within each step. So we started by formulating the research problem, uh, the second step being data collection, then data pre-processing, model development and validation, and then model implementation. And as we identified those biases, we also um, uh, um, uh, provided a table and a checklist and some uh, suggested action plans in terms of how those biases can be addressed and how those biases could potentially be mitigated as we're developing the algorithm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each one of those steps of the uh, algorithm development and implementation and kind of highlight some of the major sources of bias within each one of those steps. And again, I'll, you know, for the sake of time, I won't be going into too much details, but just to kind of, uh, kind of highlight the sources of bias and then identify certain strategies for mitigation. Um, so the first step uh, with developing, I would say, an algorithm, or regardless what kind, whether it's algorithm or research or study, it generally starts by formulating the research question. So what is it that we're trying to to address with the AI algorithm that we're that we're formulating? Uh, the proposed prediction algorithm, or what we plan to do, should be informed with inclusivity to ensure that the generated tools are not restricted to specific clinical problems or to a specific sub set of patients. And this is extremely important because a lot of times what we end up doing is coming up with a research question and then moving directly into uh, the next steps, uh, not realizing that this could be um, an, an important step that could impact certain groups of patients. Um, and there are multiple examples of that in terms of uh, research questions biased uh, to race, uh, to certain sex. Uh, there's bias in terms of global health. And there's also bias in terms of disability that we've seen with the research questions or even with the AI algorithms that favor certain groups versus others. Um, so I'll just give kind of a few examples about each one of those. So maybe the, the classic example for um, uh, bias in research questions and research support uh, based on race is when we look at cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease. Cystic fibrosis is generally a disease that affects white patients, and sickle disease is one that we primarily see in Black patients. And even though uh, there are much more patients that have sickle cell disease, we see much more funding and much more research research and much more resources going for cystic fibrosis. Um, a similar observation is seen with sex. Um, we see much more research funding for diseases uh, that are male dominant compared to diseases that are female dominant. Uh, the global health aspect is another major one where we see more funding and more resources going into uh, certain regions of the world. And there's what is known by the WHO as the 1090 gap, where 90% uh, of the research resources are, are going to 10% of the global population. And then I would say, you know, the, the part that is extremely challenging is, and just as important is the disability uh, bias in terms of disability. Uh, it's very difficult to identify disability. It's very broad. It includes a wide range of functional and, functional and mental diseases. So it's hard to define, uh, but it's one of those areas where there's extreme bias in terms of whether it's research or clinical tools or AI algorithms that take into account the disability factor and identify certain elements within that underrepresented group. Um, the next step is the data collection. And this is one of the most important steps to really think about deeply as we're formulating the AI algorithm, because it's the data that goes into developing the algorithm that determines what kind of decisions or what kind of output we get from the AI algorithms. And there's various types of biases that we can see with the data collection. Uh, maybe one that we commonly see is the sampling bias. And that's when you collect data from patient cohorts that are not necessarily represented 
representative of the entire population. And we sometimes think about sampling bias as one that you would see when the sample is small, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the case all the time. Uh, so this is an example here of a prediction model uh, for acute renal failure. Um, and the data set included 700, over 700,000 patients. It was multiple centers that were included. So it sounds like it's pretty, you know, it's pretty good in terms of the, the patient population that was included. But when you look at the cohort that was included within that data set, it was predominantly older and non-Black men. Um, the average age was 62 years old, uh, less than 20% when were Black patients, and over 90% of those patients were males. So, so it certainly is not an algorithm that I can say is valid in, uh, for example, young females, um, given the cohort that was included. So sampling bias is something that we really need to take into account. Uh, there's the measurement bias. Uh, um, so this is another important part that we're learning more and more about. Uh, and that's when uh, we're using faulty measurements to develop an AI model, regardless of whether there was good representation in the patient cohort or not. Uh, the faulty measurements will certainly impact the, uh, the uh, type of output or the type of algorithm that we develop. Uh, this, is a, this is a review paper that we published recently looking specifically at that part in terms of faulty measurements. Um, this was looking at critical bias within uh, devices that are used in critical care. Um, some are used in critical care, some are used also in non-critical care settings. But if you look at the figure here, um, these are examples, the devices or the tools that are listed there are examples of um, tools that we very commonly use in the clinical setting, the pulse oximeter, the EKG, the thermometer, these are very commonly used and are, and are um, utilized to assess patients' vital signs and to assess various aspects of the clinical patient's clinical condition. Um, the results of those devices are uh, do not perform the same, or do, such a devices do not perform the same within all patient populations. So that's something, again, to keep in mind in terms of measurement bias that can impact the output of the algorithm. Um, there are several other types of examples uh, in terms of bias that's seen in data collection. There's the classification bias, there's the label bias, and there's the missing data bias, which again, for the sake of time, I won't go into the details of that, but it's very important that as we are collecting the data and as we're including the patient cohort to determine what sources of bias we, uh, we may uh, be facing. Um, then we have the next step, which is the data pre-processing, and that's where you know we take the data, the patient-related raw data, and convert that into a readable and structured format that's ready for analysis. And we've all gone through this process of you know getting data all over the place and trying to kind of consolidate that data and come up with um, with data that's more uh, structured for analysis. Um, one approach that we commonly use is aggregation, and that aggregation, if it's not uh, done with the thought, with you know, with the with the thinking in mind that this may impact bias, then that may generate bias in the in the generated model. Uh, so aggregation bias is it's okay if you aggregate the data for patients that are similar, but sometimes we tend to aggregate the data for patients that appear to be similar, but they're not that that's not necessarily the case. So for example, uh, if we're looking at the risk of diabetes in Hispanics, uh, we may end up just combining Hispanics all in one group, when in fact, uh, the risk of bias, for example, in Mexicans may not be the same as the risk of diabetes in Puerto Ricans. Uh, so that may impact or that may generate the aggregation bias that I mentioned. The same thing with the underweight patients, for example. Uh, we tend to um, just aggregate uh, all patients that are, for example, um, with a weight less than 50 or a weight that's less than 40, and we generate certain decisions based on that, making the assumption that these are probably malnourished, maybe these are patients that have certain characteristics, but maybe it's a fully nourished patient, but that patient has an amputation, and that's the reason they're underweight. Um, so again, it's very important that as we aggregate that data, that we, we keep in mind what are some groups of patients that may be underrepresented uh, when we um, perform such kind of aggregation. 
there's the missing data bias. And I think this is something that we all face, especially when we start working with big data. Uh, the data is never complete. There's always something missing. Um, and this is very common in terms of how do we process such data. Uh, maybe the two most common methods that we use is either the complete case analysis, where we decide that uh, if the data is incomplete for certain important elements that we would eliminate those cases, or we would go with the mean imputation, where if we have outliers or we have missing data, we decide that we would go with the mean um, mean or the average for that, uh, for that specific feature or that specific variable. Um, well, that helps with the analysis. That certainly does help with the analysis. But then uh, the important part to keep in mind is that such approach does not reflect diversity in patients. So the reason patients may have missing data is because they may be different than those patients who do not have missing data. For example, a patient who's on a wheelchair and unable to get their weight uh, there's a reason that his weight is not in the medical chart, for example. Um, and when I, when I end up uh, either eliminating that patient or considering that patient as an average person who has the average weight as everybody else, then there's certain bias that's being introduced by, by that approach. There's also the feature selection. So the features that we choose may also have an element of bias. Uh, and maybe an example that I'll use kind of, you know, working in an ICU setting is sepsis. Uh, um, sepsis screening is, is recommended in the guidelines. It's something that's being utilized by a lot of institutions. Um, and as we um, screen for sepsis, there are certain features that we choose uh, to determine whether that patient is at high risk of sepsis or whether that patient may develop sepsis, depending on what stage we're looking at. But the SOFA score, for example, is one of the scores that we commonly use in sepsis. Um, and it includes several elements to determine eventually what the total score is for that patient. But that SOFA score itself uh, does not have good performance in all patient populations. So for example, and I'll, I'll use the cancer patient population, the SOFA score does not perform very well in that patient population. The same in, in female patients, the same in black patients. So the features that we choose uh, to develop our model and to develop the algorithms uh, may not be uh, with the same level of performance across all patient populations. And that's, again, what would impact uh, and bias the, the output of the algorithm. Um, then then the, next, the next step comes as the, once we've identified our research question, you know, collected our data, went through the data pre-processing, there's the model development and validation. And that typically goes through building uh, the training set. Um, and then there's the test and validation sets that are used for accuracy measurement and for validation. Um, overfitting is probably a term that a lot of us hear as we hear about as we're developing algorithms. Um, and that's encountered during the validation of the model. And with the overfitting, it's where the model appears to demonstrate to have very good performance when it's tested in its own data set. But then when you go and apply it to other populations, that's where it performs poorly. Um, and there are a lot of other types of biases that we may um, come across as we're developing the model. But the interesting part is whether it's overfitting or some of the other issues that come up, they're not commonly uh, evaluated in models that are being developed. And I'll use some of the examples as we go through. So for example, this is a review paper that we uh, published recently looking at AI algorithms that were published in the field of pharmacy practice. Um, and I want you to look at the last call at the, um, the, the red uh, column over here showing the validation. So these are studies that were looking at drug safety. And you can look, if you look at the um, column before the last in terms of external validation, none of those published algorithms had external validation. And that's, you know, something that we, we you know, something that we commonly talk about as far as validation of the algorithm. Uh, we also looked at studies um, in terms of uh, pharmacy operations. It was a similar observation where uh, none of those studies had external validation. And we also also looked at studies um, on, on precision medicine and the findings were similar in terms of the external validation. Um, this is another study where um, uh, they looked at the 152 studies um, uh, that included diagnostic and prognostic modules. 
Um, most of the studies did external validation. So about two thirds of the studies did external validation, which was great, uh, but the majority were rated as having high risk of bias due to several elements that were evaluated. Uh, the missing data was inadequately handled in 41% of the models and overfitting was improperly handled in 39% of the cases. So again, uh, and this is a large number of studies that were being looked at, uh, and there were all these issues in terms of the risk of bias within the generated models. Um, uh, the um, the last uh, the the next step uh, or the last step is the model implementation. And sometimes when we talk about model implementation, we think about you know once we develop the model, we implement that model and we're done. But the model implementation is really about implementing the model and continuing to assess that model throughout the entire lifespan, uh, because there are certain um, elements that may change and that may either impact the performance of the of the uh, model that, or the algorithm, or may also uh, introduce bias within the model that's used. Um, so we have to, con uh, to constantly uh, assess the usability, the feasibility, the generalizability of the parameters that are included within that model. Uh, there are certain um, uh, aspects that could impact the performance of the model as we use it. So there's the data drift, for example, in which the uh, population characteristics on which the model was developed become different than those patient characteristics of which the model is applied, so it does not perform as well. There's also something known as the concept drift, and where there is a change between the predictor and the predicted variable. So the relationship between the predictor, predictor and the predicted var variable that were used to develop the model would change. Um, and maybe a classic example on that, on the concept drift is the, uh, you know, an algorithm that's, de that's developed looking at, for example, the, the skin color and, um, um, and skin cancer. Um, if you're looking at the uh, skin color during the winter time, that, uh, that uh, um, association between them is not the same as if you're looking at the skin, the skin color during the summertime. Uh, so that could introduce certain concept drift uh, for the model that's developed. Um, uh, now, the, the question is, how do we address those uh, sources of bias and what are certain strategies to mitigate those um, uh, that such bias within the algorithms? Um, as I mentioned earlier, within the paper, we had a list of um, uh, and kind of a checklist of things to consider as you're going through each one of the steps of the uh, developing the algorithm. And then we had also suggested action plan in terms of what to do. Um, they can be summarized into the following main points. You know, there is the correct framing of the problem, making sure that the, uh, the research question or the algorithm is addressing an issue that's generalizable and that's important and that's not leaving people behind. Um, and I would say that the most important part and, and to address here is to make sure that the group that's working on that algorithm is pretty diverse and pretty inclusive so that people would add in their input and whatever is generated in terms of an algorithm or, a, or a, an actual problem that's being addressed um, is taking into account uh, uh, various uh, perspectives. Uh, there's the data diversification and representation that we talked about to make sure that the generated model is representative of a diverse group. Um, identifying sources of bias in the data. There's always going to be an element of bias within the data, but we really need to identify those sources up front and then determine how we can handle those sources of bias. Uh, there's also the bias within the data pre-processing and making sure that they're appropriately managed. Uh, eliminating bias during model development and validation, and then the model implementation to make sure that it's implemented within a pretty diverse group and that there's equitable model implementation as we um, roll out that model in clinical practice. Um, there are several um, tools or checklists that, that have been published to uh, guide uh, uh, researchers and authors in developing their guideline in developing their AI algorithms. Uh, the majority of those uh, tools that are available are primarily uh, targeting reviewers and authors uh, rather than going back into the initial steps of how do you actually develop the algorithm and going through each one of the, the uh, steps related to AI um, development. 
Um, uh, but they do provide some guidance. Again, they don't go through the initial steps, but they do provide some guidance in terms of what to consider as you are developing your, your um, algorithm. Um, there is a um, there's a standing together project that um, that I joined recently and uh, currently in progress. And this is a project where we're actually looking, kind of taking the the AI a few steps back and looking at the data that's being developed for the data sets and what actually needs to be included, what kind of standards need to be incorporated within those uh, those data sets. Uh, um, uh, it's currently in the, you know, the process of, of working on those recommendations, um, and it's primarily to uh, support diversity, inclusivity, and generalizability in the data sets that are utilized to develop AI algorithms. Uh, we've included a pretty diverse group. It's a very nice diverse group in terms of global representation and in terms of the disciplines that are represented, and it's led by the University of Birmingham. Um, now, the question is, um, you know, can we have a perfect algorithm? Absolutely not. Uh, are we going to eliminate uh, the, the bias? Absolutely not. But I would say the first step that we really need to, to focus on is recognizing and acknowledging this issue, that AI algorithms are not the magical bullet. They're not going to uh, save healthcare and, and promote health equity the way it was initially presented. Uh, there, we have to recognize that there it could be a source of bias and it could be a source of health disparity. Um, the second part is we need to acknowledge that we also need standards. So uh, kind of as going back to what Leo had mentioned earlier is there has to be some, some kind of policies and some kind of can, uh, standards that would regulate the AI algorithms and models that are being developed. We have to implement those. Uh, and unless it is something that's, that's required at a policy level, uh, I would say, um, implementation will be difficult, but we have to work on implementing whatever standards we identify, um, and we have to be transparent. Uh, end of the day, again, as I mentioned earlier, we will not have a perfect model, and there will continue to be sources of bias, uh, not intentional, but because there are some that we know, some that we don't, uh, but we have to be transparent in terms of how we gathered the data, what do we anticipate are the sources of bias, what we were able to do and what we were not able to do in terms of some de-biasing techniques and how the model was generated. Um, so in summary, um, again, AI algorithms uh, were initially proposed as a means to improve healthcare and promote health equity. But I think you know the message now is that such algorithms are associated with bias and disparities and that we need to take that into account as we are developing the AI algorithms. Um, we need to identify the sources of bias within each step and address those. Um, I have to say that our understanding of bias in AI is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much that we don't know. Um, and that's why I mentioned earlier that we need to be transparent with what we've done so that we kind of understand more of what are the sources of bias and what needs to be addressed. Um, and to be able to really achieve the full potential of the AI technology, it has to be um, a goal that everybody has, and it has to be from all stakeholders. Uh, and I, I would say that stakeholders, when it comes to AI algorithms, are not just the clinicians, are, and they're not just the AI researchers. Um, there are patient advocacy groups, there are health equity scholars, governmental agencies, there are the industry. Uh, these are all considered the stakeholders in the development of AI tools and in the development of AI algorithms. Um, so with that, I get to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this, and uh, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Lama, for, for that very comprehensive talk, and uh, all the way from you know the recognizing the the bias uh, that can creep in all the way to suggesting some of the, some of the uh, strategies for reduction uh, thank you for for doing that uh, i'm going to actually uh, ask a question to to leo uh, leo from from your worldview because you travel a lot and uh, you have good knowledge of how uh, bias is being handled uh, at different places across the world what are, who are, who do you think are the front runners in in recognizing and dealing with these strategies from the different governments or organizations point of view and and what can we learn from them uh, as we try to mitigate and have similar standards across the world do, do you think uh, us 
or Europe have done enough to 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 deal with this, or are there other countries that are handling this better? Um, no, there's no one handling this quite well. Um, I think the EU AI Act is actually a step in the right direction in making sure that there's complete transparency on uh, what data sets were used to train the algorithm. Uh, what we're hoping to promote here in the United States is that there is mandatory reporting of um, who are buying the, the AI models to. So I guess this is beyond the, the bias issue. Uh, the, the biggest, the, one of the biggest fears is that AI will be used against you. Um, and that requires that there is complete transparency on who are developing the models, what data it is being trained on, and who are buying and, and deploying these models. Uh, we also would like some more regulation on who companies are selling health and wellness data to, because right now um, we don't know. Everything is happening behind closed doors. Um, big companies are partnering with Epic and with large healthcare institutions and developing these AI models uh, without transparency on who is developing what models and for what purpose. So to us, this is really the only way forward. And I could tell you that no one country is ahead of the ball game. I think the EU has uh, has its, uh, set, its sights set on the right path. Uh, what I also wanted to point out is we, we here we are talking about AI when most countries don't have a data pipeline. Um, so for, for AI to be developed, you need high resolution, uh, really electronic health record data set, but countries even do not know what proportion of their health records are digitized. So to me, it's a bit premature to talk about bias when in fact, the data sets don't even exist to develop AI. And again, as has been said earlier, people have this magical idea that AI can be conjured out of nowhere. Well, no data, no AI. And we need to invest more money in creating those data sets, creating data pipelines uh, for most of the world. Because even here in the United States, we only have data pipelines in the top institutions like Mayo and Stanford and Duke. The vast majority of hospitals, community hospitals, safety net hospitals, they don't have any data pipeline and we can't be selling models developed on Mayo data and implement them on these hospitals without fine tuning. So as I said, I, I'm, I'm definitely in agreement that we should talk about these issues now, but let's not forget that AI is out of reach for most of the world because they just don't have the data pipeline. And then, and of course the lack of capacity we need to beef up, speed up the way we're teaching our students on data science because right now the, the, the course of AI is being charted by the richest of the rich. It's the IBMs and the Amazons and uh, the Epic and the open AI. And the rest of us don't have any say. We're, we're trying to catch up. And we know that health equity is not in their minds. Uh, their, their intention is to make money. And they, they at some point, they would want to recoup their billion dollar investments on AI. And in the meantime, we're at the back seat and we're being swept away by the AI revolution. And I don't think at the rate we're going, we're, we're heading the right direction. So somehow we need to build the plane faster because it's, it's flying very, very quickly. And if it crashes, you can imagine what's the impact. So there are a lot of things that we need to do. And it's not just, again, investing on the computational power or investing on the data set, but investing on the people, making sure that everyone is up to speed and identifying the bias in the data, the pitfalls of artificial intelligence. So, sorry, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think we yeah, should have no, a discussion I to talk about this. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's a lot to unpack. And yeah, the, the knowledge for having another session to come back is great. 
Uh, I'm going to take a couple of uh, key questions from here. I think one from Dr. Shivani Fotida, she was mentioning uh, autonomous. I don't think we are there for autonomous. We still have like the clinician in loop uh, so far uh, as it stands right now. So uh, there's not much autonomous uh, AI uh, that is out there at least creeping into to healthcare. Uh, and some of the responses there there are very helpful. But uh, Dr. Mishra, I had a question for you about uh, this discussion about imputation techniques. So uh, should we just, if there's missing data, just not do anything with that or uh, how to handle imputation techniques? And uh, in my opinion, at minimum, it needs to be addressed and be transparent, like what imputation techniques you used and and, and things, what are your thoughts on uh, using imputation if there is missing data? Lama, I'm gonna go to you. What do you think? Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll I'll do like a quick and simple answer. I think it's about eventually you have to use some kind of mechanism to handle the raw data that you have. Um, uh, transparency is a key, and I think with every step in the AI, transparency is a key. Uh, I think it's going to take us a long time before we uh, understand the full mechanisms of how we can process the data in the best mechanism of debiasing. And it's going to take us years and years before we see pipeline of data coming out from the underrepresented countries, underrepresented regions, underrepresented uh, you know groups. I think it's 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 years before we get to that. But as long as we're clear in terms of what mechanism we used um, and what data set we used and what are the limitations of what we've done, then that makes it easier to understand how we can apply those algorithms. But to, to deal with AI as a black box and not really knowing what's what, what the underlying causes are, uh, then that would end up being kind of similar to the example that Obermeyer uh, investigated where it was a full-blown um, AI algorithm that was implemented. And then it wasn't until later on that it was realized that that is actually causing certain, contributing to certain health disparities. Uh, um, so I would say, you know, transparency, uh, going through the thought process, you know, there's never going to be a perfect approach of what works best for um, uh, um, for um, data pre-processing, for data collection, but just going through the process, the thinking process, and identifying which one you think may be the, the, the one that is associated with the least bias. And we may end up doing a, kind of an algorithm using multiple methods and seeing which one works best. So it could be an imputation using one kind of mechanism and then doing and generating another algorithm using a different type of in, uh, imputation and seeing which one has a better performance in everyone, including the, the underrepresented groups. That's great. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Leo, Lama, and Shreya for their ex excellent talks. A very engaged crowd over here. Uh, clearly, we are very biased about this topic. So hopefully, we have to bring this back on another day for, for a follow-up. Uh, appreciate everyone joining us. Please follow BrainX community through website, through the social media, through our various other channels, including YouTube. Until next time, thank you everyone for joining us.